Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time it's the second of two episodes in which I'm building a silent Mini-ITX PC. In the last video I put the hardware together, and so this time we're moving on to software which is going to be Linux based. People often ask me what are the applications you always personally install on a new Linux PC, and so in this video you're going to find out. And also, because many people are interested, we'll be checking out my new hardware's power consumption. Right, here is the silent PC we put together in the previous episode. And to remind you, this is based on an Intel Celeron quad-core J4105 processor with a base frequency of 1.5 GHz, bursting to 2.5 GHz. And we equip this PC with 8 GB of a DDR4 memory, and it's also got a Samsung Evo 250 GB SSD. And if you're thinking it's a Celeron and that worries you, do not judge modern Celerons on the basis of previous Celerons from decades ago. This should be a perfectly capable small computer, capable of running a wide range of applications silently with a low power drain. And while setting things up, I'm going to be connecting this via Ethernet. I always prefer to connect things via Ethernet when you're setting up a PC. But after that, this PC will spend most of its time working as a media PC sitting next to a television. And for that, I'm going to give it a Wi-Fi dongle to give it a, a wireless network connection like that. And talking of things connected to this computer, I've also gone and bought it this, which is a Microsoft all-in-one media keyboard, a wireless keyboard, one of these things that has a dongle that plugs into the PC and obviously the keyboard wirelessly communicates with the dongle. I don't currently own a full-size keyboard with a, with a trackpad which connects wirelessly and this seemed to be a good idea to uh, control this uh, new PC. So uh, let's get inside, I think it's straightforward, just have to bring in Stanley the knife and cut through a little bit of the uh, tape there like that and uh, oh here we are and aha! There it is, nice and straightforward. I must admit, Microsoft do make very nice. There we are, tip it out. Oh, there's the dongle, there's the dongle. Always worry because you find a dongle, there it is. Microsoft do make, as I was saying, very nice uh, keyboards and mice and things like that. This is a most straightforward device. Crinkle, crinkle, come out, come out. There we are, I can get in. Yes, there we are, and probably what else have we got in the box? We've got manuals and things for a keyboard. That's good, isn't it? But uh, all we really need is some batteries to go in the back. Maybe they're here already. Do you think they are? Oh, they're here already just to take out the thing like that. And uh, this is all ready. So we've got the keyboard to uh, put next to the PC and the dongle to plug in the back. So if we just go and uh, put these with the PC, I think we should now think about finding an operating system. Right, on our silent PC we're going to install Ubuntu 20.04, which is a very mainstream Linux distro with long-term support. It receives updates until April 2025. I covered Ubuntu 20.04 on this channel in depth back in April 2020 when it was first released, so here I'll just quickly go through the install process, but if you want more information look back to that Ubuntu 20.04 video. But basically what we need to do is on the Ubuntu website, here we are, we need to download the operating system. And as you can see, I've already downloaded it on this uh, PC. So uh, now I can just go to a program called Belena Etcher, which I'm going to use to write the Ubuntu image file to this USB drive I've got plugged into my laptop. And all I need to do in Belena Etcher, which you can obtain from belena.io forward slash etcher, is to select the image. There we are, there it is, there. It's already picked up our USB drive, and we can just click on Flash. And we'll have to uh, accept a few uh, Windows dialogues there. There we are, and the process will start. And uh, there we are. And we now just need to remove the USB drive from this computer, go across to the patiently waiting silent PC, insert the USB drive, and power the system up. And after a few seconds, we'll get to this menu where the default option will serve us absolutely fine. And if we speed on through, we'll boot into Ubuntu where we can select the option to install Ubuntu. 
Next, we just have to set our regional settings. And then here on the next screen, we'll do a normal installation. We'll download updates whilst installing, and we'll also install the third-party codecs and other useful things like that. Here on the next screen, the default option is to erase disk and install Ubuntu, which is what we want to do. So I'll click on the Install Now. And the installer will just check this is really what we want to do. Next, I'll confirm my geographic location. And then in this screen, I need to enter my name, the computer name, and to set a password for my account. And there we are, it's finished. So all we need to do is uh, restart now. Remove our USB drive and press enter. And here we are rebooting, hopefully into a freshly installed copy of Ubuntu. Then here we are arrived on the login screen where clearly I'll select me, enter my password, and we'll arrive on the Ubuntu desktop where we see the initial opening wizard. We will uh, skip connected accounts. I will uh, skip that as well. Oh yes, I'm okay sending information to Canonical to make Ubuntu uh, and we'll leave location services off. And there we are, we're all ready to go. We've installed Ubuntu on our silent PC. Greetings. Here I am back again in Ubuntu where I've made a few scaling and thematic changes and I'm working everything very successfully using the Microsoft Media Keyboard. And indeed, if I give you a shot of that so you can see the trackpad, we just go down here, for example, and bring up applications, you can see things like a two finger scrolling work absolutely fine. And indeed, if we look at the other end of the keyboard, you can see things like the volume control also work perfectly well, and indeed the boot button too. So there's no problems with drivers on a device like this wireless keyboard using a Linux based system. Now, here we can see all the applications pre-installed. We've got things like the Firefox web browser, LibreOffice, Thunderbird email client, things like that. But I did say I'd show you the applications I normally install on a new Linux system. And so to do that, we're going to go to Ubuntu software. And uh, here under the different categories, we'll start, of course, for me with uh, art and design, where always on a new system, I'm going to install GIMP, the GNU image manipulation program. And uh, there we are, it is installed, but I always want more than one graphics package. For a start, I tend also to install Critter, which is a painting program, but very useful to do some of the things that uh, GIMP isn't so good at, so we'll install Critter as well. There we are. And I also like to have a vector-based graphics package, a structured graphics package for things like logos and diagrams, things like that. So for that, as you can see, we're going to install Inkscape. And there we are, we've got that one there as well. Three graphics packages installed. And if you want to know more about those packages, you can look in the videos I've made about them, which I'll link to in the video description. But for now, we'll move on to uh, music and audio. And here, the thing I want to install is Audacity, which is a nice little audio editor sitting there with its little headphones and whatever that is in the middle. So we'll install Audacity. There we are, and then Keeping with the theme of doing things which are creative, that type of stuff, I'm going to go down to photo and video where many people may want to install VLC, the VLC media player. Now, I'm not going to install that because I think the video player you get by default in Ubuntu is pretty good, but you might want VLC. But what I do want from here is Caden Live, the Caden Live video editor, which were installed from there. And you might be wondering, how successful will video editing be on a PC like this, of this specification? Well, you'll find out a bit later in the video when I'll do some tests with uh, Caden Live, which uh, happily has now installed. So uh, there we are, we've installed quite a few packages there. And we'll just uh, close that down, going over there, and we'll check they've arrived in our applications, which hopefully, yes, they have. There's GIMP and Inkscape and Caden Live and Critter and Audacity, that's uh, really nice. But I also want to install another web browser as well. 
And this is not because I don't like the Firefox web browser, I do use a Firefox web browser, but I always like to have multiple browsers on any system I'm going to use. And we could go back into the software manager to actually find a browser there. We could go to productivity, where you'll find we've got the, uh, the Chromium browser, but I'm not gonna install Chromium, I actually want to install Chrome, which I know will shock some people. Some people don't seem to like Chrome very much, they've got things against Google, but personally, I'm a big user of G Suite. I spend a lot of time on YouTube and I do like to have the Chrome browser. And to install that, we have to go to a browser, which is kind of ironic. I know we'll launch a Firefox to install Chrome. And the page we have to go to is here, google.com forward slash Chrome, where we click on, surprisingly enough, download Chrome. And you can see it's identified we're running on a Linux based system. So we can just click on accept and install. And uh, what I'm going to do is to save the file. The default here normally I think actually is software install straight away, but I'm going to save the file. I always like saving files and working with them myself. I'll click on OK. It'll save to download. It might be doing that by default on a new system you set up. I always change things in a browser so it tells me where things are going to be saved. And uh, we can see the file is downloading up here. So we'll just let that complete. And by Jingo, it's done it. So all we have to do now is to go into the uh, file manager. There we are. Doesn't it look nice in the dark theme I've selected in the Ubuntu 20.04? And we'll go to Downloads, open that up. And there we are, there's our file. Click it there and it'll open up the software installer and allow us to install Google Chrome. So clearly click on Install, enter our password. And to my delight, if other people's horror, we've now got the Chrome browser installed on this system. And uh, just to prove it, we'll go down there. Is it there? Yes, it is. We can uh, launch Google Chrome. And there we are. We've installed Google Chrome on our silent PC. Right. Just before we move on to install a few useful utilities, I thought I'd address running streaming services on a Linux system, because you might have heard it's not possible to run all of the mainstream streaming services on a Linux system. And so the best thing I can do is to run up this like this. And here you can see I am logged into Disney Plus, which is working absolutely fine. It didn't used to work on Linux, it now does. And I've been testing it out, as you can see, I've watched a large chunk of an episode of The Mandalorian in the name of testing, and it works absolutely fine. I obviously can't show you this for uh, copyright purposes, but you might be interested to know that it works. And uh, we could just do a F11 on the keyboard, and it'll uh, push it up to full screen, all ready to watch some episodes. So as you can see, this means I'm absolutely prepared for the 30th October 2020, but I thought more generally you might be interested to know that you can use a Linux system to access services like Disney+. Plus. Right, moving on from a galaxy far, far away, I thought we'd install a few utilities on this system, things I always install on a new Linux installation. So I run up a terminal, and before we do any installs in a terminal, it's always a good idea to do a sudo apt and uh, update to update the repositories on the system. In other words, the list of locations where software will be downloaded from. And I also like to clear my screen as well, keep things tidy. Now, the first utility I always put onto a Linux system is HD parameters, which is a drive testing utility, which you can install using the syntax sudo apt install HD palm but I've discovered this is already pre-installed in Ubuntu 20.04, so we're going to go straight to running the utility to test the speed of the SSD on this system. I think I've got the syntax sitting in the buffer. There we are to test SDA1, which is the SSD. We'll run that just to see how fast the SSD is on this system. Remember, it's an internal SATA SSD, absolute maximum speed about 600 megabytes a second. That's come out at a 495. That's pretty good. We've got a pretty decent disk speed on this system. The next thing I want to install is hard info, which is a Linux utility for checking hardware information. And we can install that with a sudo apt install hard info like that. And that will hopefully install. Do we want to continue? Yes, we do. And there we are, it is installed. And we can now run hard info by typing hard info. There we are. And uh, it'll come up and let's just uh, pull out the edges. 
There we are, we can see things a little better there. And I do like this utility, it shows you lots and lots of uh, hardware information. We can see here we've got our CPU, four cores, four threads. It tells us all about the motherboard, the storage there. But the particular thing I'm interested in is the sensors on this quiet PC to see how warm this PC is getting. Because clearly this is a passively cooled system. There's no case fan, there's no CPU fan. And it's idling along, it's not been doing much here at the moment, at about what, uh, 40-ish really, I think is the best thing to take from that. In the next segment of the video, we're also going to look at power consumption and we'll try stressing the thing out. But for the moment, I think that's a, a fairly reasonable set of temperatures to be displaying. So I'm going to get rid of that and once again, clear my screen just to be nice and tidy. And the final utility I want to install is Veracrypt. And Veracrypt is software for creating and accessing encrypted drives and encrypted containers. And the nice thing about Veracrypt is you can use it on Windows machines, Linux machines, and Macs. And as I use it a lot on Windows machines, it's very useful to have it available on a Linux machine as well. So I can use encrypted USB drives across different systems. So it's slightly involved to install it because first of all, we have to add it to the repository with a, this command, which will enter like this. There we are. And we now need to do another sudo apt and uh, update to make sure this is going to work when we actually install it. And now we can do a sudo apt install and uh, veracrypt like that. And there we are, we now seem to have veracrypt installed on this system. We can soon find out. Is it sitting here now in uh, there? There we are, there's veracrypt, let's run it up. Always great when something works, isn't it? And uh, what we now do is I'm going to select a file which is an encrypted container. I've copied one onto this system in documents and encrypted containers and there's one of my many, many encrypted containers which will open up there. And in theory I can mount that by putting in, oh dear I haven't selected a drive slot. Yes in Linux we have to select drive slots. There's no drive letter so we select a slot and we mount and now enter my password and enter and it'll now want my system password. And there we are, it should have uh, mounted that volume, which I think we can access just by clicking on that. Yes, there we are. We can now access the files in that encrypted container. And if you want to know more about Veracrypt, just look in my video where I show you how to create encrypted USB drives and encrypted containers. Right, I'm now going to test out the power consumption of our silent PC by taking this power meter and plugging it in between the mains outlet and the PC's power lead. And as you can see, initially we've got clearly got no power being used there at all. Even the adapter isn't plugged in. I'm now going to plug in the adapter. So the power lead's gone into the adapter and we get a small amount of power draw there. It'll settle down. A couple of watts is being used when the PC isn't even turned on, but the power adapter is connected. Always worth remembering that. And now I'll turn on the PC Let's in fact bring up a shot so you can see the PC screen and the power meter so you can see what's going on. We'll turn on the PC like that. It is starting to boot. Hopefully there we are. We've got it up on the screen. Power use has clearly gone up about 10 watts. I always find it fascinating watching a PC boot and watching a power meter at the same time. It doesn't keep much to keep me amused up to about what, uh, 17, 18 watts. Oh yeah, 16. Oh, but it's not a lot, is it? It is, it is very good. When you think we used to have PCs using hundreds and hundreds of watts, oh, we've got to a login screen. So I'll just uh, log in. There we are going in. A bit more power use as it runs up the desktop. But it's going to settle down hopefully in a second. Startup processes always take a lot longer to complete when you think. You really see this when you're watching a power meter. So things are still clearly going on. We've been up to about 16 watts, but we all settle down it seems at about sort of eight watts, eight to 10 watts. So the, the idle power use is really very impressive indeed. So let's transition across to a second half of this test where, as you can see, I've run up the Caden Live video editor and I've created a test edit. Now if I just run this, you'll see Caden Live works perfectly well on our passively called Celeron PC. The transitions play there perfectly well, not even using proxy clips here. And as we can see on the power meter, this pushes a power use up to about sort of the mid 20 watts doing things in Cadent Live. 
And I've also got hard info running so we can see temperatures, which have uh, leapt up. I got to 62 though as we were doing that, but uh, are basically running at around the mid 50s after I've been editing here in Caden Live. But what I want to do is to go to render. I've got a render script set up. We'll start that script and uh, we'll see what sort of temperatures we get up to as we render this out and also what it does to power consumption, which seems to have leapt up to about uh, 19 watts. And uh, here we are coming towards the end of the script. We can see our temperatures have got into the high 60s, 69 there, which is pretty high, although ooh, we got to 70. But a J4105 can sustain up to 105 degrees, so relative to that, this temperature is not too bad. And we can see the render finished in 1 minute 37, which is not that shabby a time for a render with about, what, about 50 seconds of video. So I'm pretty impressed with this. I think we've shown it's possible to edit video on a passively cooled Celeron using only about sort of 18 to 25 watts of power, which I think is, is really rather impressive indeed. As we've seen in this video, it's possible to run a very wide range of applications on a silent, energy-efficient Mini-ITX PC with an embedded processor. Everything here we've done in Linux, although you could do a very similar setup using Windows, although there you'd have to buy a Windows license. But now that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, and I hope to talk to you again very soon.